I recently had the opportunity to run a Zettelkasten seminar for the Artificial Intelligence and Music Technology program for the Queen Mary University of London. This is the second part to the seminar where we dive deep into using Obsidian, the note-taking app, which really allows students to conduct the right workflow for their research program. So if you are interested in getting the high quality version of this and the PDFs, then do head over to atomicnotetaking.com where I will be making those available. Otherwise, enjoy the video and leave a comment of any questions that you have. Okay, so let me just adjust this so that you can see it. Uh, that'll do. Okay, so uh, has anybody, raise your hand if you use VS Code. Okay, cool. So it's kind of a bit like that. So it's like an integrated development environment, but we could call it an integrated thinking environment. And what we mean by that, it's very flexible. You can customize the layout of it. You can change the theme of it. You can install plugins for it. And basically you can make it your own. It's integrated into different workflows and quite extensible. And that's where Obsidian's really taking off in the note-taking space because the community have really embraced the plugin architecture and they're creating all kinds of cool things. Um, may not be for everyone because it is it's a bit like VS Code if you're using that. So uh, something on the more niche side. Um, yeah. So the concept of Obsidian is you create these things called vaults. And that's basically a folder on your computer that stores all your notes and all the things you take into your vault. So that could be PDFs, it could be any other kind of files that you want to capture in here. Uh, and that is just a folder on your computer. And one of the cool things about that is all your notes are markdown format. So they're .md files. You can open them in a text editor and you can get them out. So if we're using a cloud-based kind of note-taking system, you have that question, how do I get my notes out if things don't pan out with this product? Uh, and Obsidian are, your notes are your notes, they're on your computer, they're yours, we just provide the software. So that's pretty good. If you want to create new vaults uh, down here in the left-hand side, um, you can create new ones here, you can open existing vaults, and uh, there is a, um, a service by Obsidian to synchronize your notes across different devices, uh, and so you can create a sync vault there. But if you're like me, you just stick your vault on an iCloud drive, and then I get it on my iPad without having to pay. Yeah. In that regard, uh, I have a note. Uh, it's like I used to have uh, using like Google Drive to synchronize, and there is this, sometimes there, there are problems that it creates duplicates. Okay. I had like problem with it creates duplicates. Uh, but like now I use GitHub. There is this Git um, plugin. Excellent. That is incredibly useful. You can set automatically, automatically, like every five minutes, it commits and push. Love it. Love it. So that's a really good idea. Really. Because um, it's again a folder on your computer, you can check it into Git and then have all the benefits of that and check it out into other. And it, it, it's like it's so self contained that you, if you do it's like um, in a new, in a new laptop. That I've never seen the world. You just do git clone, it downloads and also the plugins and yeah. everything. So it's it's also very useful if you're I mean in my case I'm using Obsidian uh, to draw a study that someone needs to review for me before I submit it. And if you want to have collaborators and have conversions, you have most random knowledge. Yeah. I've I've played with it in a work setting where I'm trying to create a repository for code guidelines. Uh, and you can check that into, into Git, or you can check it out. If you're in Obsidian, they can update it. And then, of course, if you've got collaborative work going on, you get your own individual accounts under the commits, um, which is good. Mark, I was thinking about turning the lights on. Maybe you could switch to light mode. Yeah, should we do that? So uh, Obsidian has a dark mode and light mode, and um, uh, there are ways to switch that. And I think I can go, so, so, the, uh, so I'm doing the Apple peel. Control P, I guess, on Windows. Uh, for the command palette, and I can go use light mode. So, should we put the lights? Lights? Where are the lights? Right there. Right. Yeah, lights. We'll get used to it, right? Hopefully, it's still pretty fine. Um, so, yeah. Um, 
So offline, create vaults, you can have many vaults. So if you've got different kind of isolated projects, maybe you've got a collaborative project, get your Zeth and Kasten. Maybe you've got one just for code uh, that you want to do. Um, personally, I would probably create two Zeth and in vaults, one if it's purely technical and another where it's kind of more other things that I want to research in terms of personal development and all those kind of things, purely because I'm very unlikely to link a piece of code to maybe something about mindset. You know, it's you can get a feel for you know, when you would separate those. Might that be a case where you use two folders and one box as well, opposed to two boxes? Well, you could do that. It depends if you want to, uh, like when you're linking things and you're searching things, you're going to see both merged in the in the search results. For sure. Uh, yeah, if I had a vault, maybe that's collaborative with work or other people, then yeah. Uh, use, your, use your own best judgment, really. Um, okay, so this here on the left-hand side is basically just a set of folders. So or it could be like Google Drive, where you create folders and you can put stuff in them. Um, so I could have a notes folder, for example, and then within there, I can create a new note and then give it a title so my new note and now i can start editing this so the title they made an update it used to be that you put you had the file name and then you had the heading but now they've merged the file name is the heading there's a way to turn that off if you're in particular there but uh, essentially that up here is actually the file name i believe um not necessarily the heading um and then it's markdown so if you're not familiar with markdown the idea the concept is you've got markup. HTML is markup. So you're creating this structure of which content lives within. And markdown is a human readable form, easy to edit, easy to read, where it's not as complicated. So the name I'm guessing is the opposite of markup, markdown, uh, where text first with some kind of parameterization that allows you to make things do stuff. So for example, a heading one would be like that. And then two hashes would be a heading Two, for example, I can uh, do bullet point lists with an asterisk. And the editor is quite nice. It kind of continues that. I want to do a numbered list. And then see how it basically puts the numbers forward. Yeah. Do you have a way to squeeze from bullet points to numbering? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I have the long way of doing it by removing the asterisk and putting a one and if depending on the length of my list uh, it could take me a little bit of time i haven't come across that and i've not thought that question um maybe it's a plugin for it. that's a good question uh, but yeah this they they added a few versions ago the ability to kind of preview what it looks like when you're not on the line um to a degree so you'll notice that my my numbers are now formatted, my headings are formatted, but as soon as I go over, it switches back to the markdown view. Uh, you can turn that on or off. And if you do turn it off, there's the reader view mode, which sort of, that basically renders it to HTML and that's what it's putting out here. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's the concept there. Uh, so yeah, markdown's pretty simple. It's pretty standardized across different products. For the most part, um, only exception is in the spec markdown. You can put headings instead of doing a hash. You can put um, dashes or something as a heading. See, so made it a heading, but the preview sort of breaks the preview there. This doesn't make it as neat because it's over two lines. And I bet the developer of that absolutely cursed when they realized that the two pieces of functionality don't sort of align. Um, but you can use uh, double dashes, single dashes to level one and level two headings, or just number of hashes, which is much simpler. So if you're doing readme's and things like that for GitHub, it's basically the same. Uh, you could do paragraphs. Oh. Um, I just got a lot of uh, uh, jam uh, like front matters. Uh, is that supported? You know, to the end. Yes, I will come on to front matter. Yes. Um, you can do things like bold. So uh, I think it's double asterisk bold. Okay. So you can just Google, there's a, like a top leg Google, like markdown formats or something like that. The only thing that's really relevant in Obsidian at this point is how to link things. Um, and then we'll cover like how to attach things and put images and stuff like that. Um, although I haven't got any files to put in, so that'll be fun. Um, but yeah, so traditional markdown, you would create a link 
to and um, say Google I could put there. So that would link to Google. Um, but remember what I said about the internal links? Uh, what Obsidian allows you to do is just the double square brackets, and then you can link. Now, if you're lazy and you haven't actually got the note, um, I can just create it here. And then when I click on it, it'll go and create that for me. So I can start specking out things um, uh, and then use the links to generate it on the fly. So if you know there's something that you want to create more notes on, but you don't want to do it right now, you can do that. And in the graph view, you can see the what's called like orphaned links. Um, yeah. will, will it still be late if you change the, the name of the note? Oh, should we try? Mm -hmm. So um, that doesn't happen with tags. With tags, I don't think. I don't know. That's a good question. I'm not sure I know the answer. So no. I've just got to change this link, the, sorry, the, the file name. Okay. And it's prompted. What do I want to do? Do I always want to just update everything that links to it? Just this once or not to update? I'll say always update. So if I go back to here, now that has changed. And remember what I said about conversational titles versus kind of like more kind of title titles, whatever that means. You'll notice that I really can't have that link look like something that the name is called. Because if I change the name, it'll link to the wrong thing or it'll update to, to the new you know so just be mindful of how you want to title your notes and then how you want to link it so if you're doing lots of title case kind of notes you might want to put it in references so that your your atomic note flows better did you say what version of obsidian are you looking at? uh the, the the latest um so look this is 1.1.9 1. 1. um yeah. yeah, that's becoming a better question. In uh, in the settings, in there is options and there is like files and links. Wait, what? In the settings, in, there is options and then there is a which is for files and files and links, and you can say automatically update internal links, and you can I don't have turn it on or it won't. Yeah. yeah. So that that dialogue would have turned the setting on. Um, yeah, there's a couple of other things uh, like default location for new notes. If you like to have a few folders, so if you've got your permanent notes or your Zettelkast and folder, you might want to just say store them in uh, the same folder as the file I'm linking from. So that kind of I like that because otherwise it's just put it in the root and uh, and I wonder where, where's it gone. Um, uh, and yeah, new link format. You can either do fully relative. Uh, or what is called shortest path. So you'll notice that this another is the shortest path because if I look at that, even though it's in a different folder, it sort of resolves. Yeah, but I'm just going to move that there, and it should still link through. Uh, I think I have to do command click to. Oh no, command click does a preview of it, um, and I think control click is into it something. So yeah, um, with Markdown you can embed, you can link to things like images and things like that, but if you just drag an image in, it'll save it in your your vault and put the link, the image link um, parameters. Um, and the under, uh, so default location for new attachments, you might just want to customize that where if I put anything in, it'll just go straight to the root of the, um the vault so all my pdfs and images and jpegs and whatever we just start clustering that up i can do it in the same folder uh in the folder specified below so i could actually put it in a specific folder and give it that name there or i could put it in the folder that the note is in or in a subfolder under the current note which is quite nice uh so i could put like files there and then in theory if i drag is there any way for the subfolder to be dynamically known? Like, let's say that I want the subfolder to be attachments dash the name of the um, of the node or something like that. Um, let's have a look at the options. What was it? Uh, so the there's only four options. Does this? So I can do a subfolder with a given folder name. Hmm. But you can't have the folder name specific to the note name. I don't think that's an option, if that if I understand that correctly. 
So, uh, sorry, just one second. So basically, if I drag a file in, so that's embedded it. Um, if I were to look at this, I'm just going to change the editor view so that I don't get the live preview so you can see the markdown more. Uh, it's basically the link to the shortest path to that file name puts the exclamation mark in front of the link, which is to preview it. And we'll touch on why that's really useful um, in a bit. But that's how you put a PDF in. That's now in my vault, synchronized across my devices. If I want to preview that note, I can see the contents. Um, so if you want to collate lots of PDFs, you'll probably use Zotero for that probably. But you know, it's a way to do that. Sorry, yes. Um, can you really make links within the same vault or can you link to other vaults? Uh, it would have to be the same vault because it doesn't know really anything about the other vaults that's mm -hmm. scoping. Cool. You could probably create a link to somewhere on your file system, but it's absolutely oh, to check it out in the same place. Yeah. Oh, no, that's what I was just okay. Saying. Yeah, you can probably see file colon slash slash something or other, and it will. Gotcha. Um, uh, yeah. So. So yeah, basically you can put things in. If that was an image, it would have put that in, and then I can. Uh, either annotate around it, and if I put it into reader mode, then I can actually see that thing. Um, there is a thing called Obsidian Publish, so if you want to put it on the web, and it has a nice, take, takes all the preview modes and publishes it on the web. I've not played with that, um, but uh, some quite nice published set little castings that people have put uh, on the web that you can explore and see their structure and how they've, how they've done things. Um, yeah. So that's kind of of the basics about the editor you just type in it use markdown yeah yeah sorry and i i missed there when you link a pdf is it uh, stored in your vault or is correct so if i right click this folder and go reveal in finder this is now what my vault looks like on the file system uh, i'm in the notes subfolder and then within there I've actually made a copy. So I dragged from my desktop into the vault and it made a copy of that file, which I really like. I don't want to link to something that I'm going to delete later. So if you, it's from your downloads folder straight into your vault, um, really nice. And then you can check it into Git or use iCloud or uh, whatever. So anything can go in as, uh, it could be a video, it could be a video, it Correct. could be a PDF, it could be a, you know, an image. Yep. Um, and they'll all, because the way you just configured it, they'll all go into that file. Yeah, correct. So it won't be cluttering up for the names of the other. Correct. Depending on the file type, it might have a pre way to preview that, like, I can read that PDF in Obsidian, because basically Obsidian is a web app packaged as a desktop app. So whatever you can do in that sort of technology space, then it should work. Um, you can do some interesting things. Um, so you can... Well, I'll cover that later. Um, okay, so yeah, drag things in, create your notes. Uh, you can create your notes over here. Uh, so right-click, new note, new subfolder, um, shortcuts the settings, sets attachment folder, usual kind of things you would expect in sort of an IDE kind of experience. Um, now, when you're working on your files, uh, you're going to want to kind of work on multiple things at once, and um, something that's I'm just going to drag this down because they so they introduced a number of versions ago uh, the ability to have multiple tabs so i can create tabs here um i could probably open open the pdf itself straight into a tab which is quite quite nice so i've got note there tab there and then maybe i just want to drag that over and i have that as a reference while i'm making notes on it so that's a nice way of um kind of utilizing the space there there's no reason why i can't I think I can do this. Oh no. Uh, you're looking at a, a paint, you're looking at two panes. Sir? Two panes, yeah. yeah. So the difference between panes and tabs. Yeah, so panes are the surface area. So a pane can have multiple tabs. So that's, that's the distinction. So I can have multiple tabs here and I can, a bit like Google Chrome, if you use that, you can drag a tab out, not out of Obsidian, but into another, another zone. And you can go as complicated as you wish, depending on. The size of your screen. Um, uh, one thing to note, and if you're used to VS Code, it's probably a sort of similar thing depending on how you have the settings that, so I'm looking at this note here, another, 
sorry for the bad naming, but I click on that one because that was the last focus pane. That's the one that the new note opens with. And I've lost see, another note, but I've got these back and forward arrows. So I'm sort of on the fence myself about the fluidity of how well that is to navigate and whether you have the context. There's, there's a bugbear I have with VS Code of, you know, having to really focus on which file where was the one I was just looking at. So just pay attention. You just need to understand the concepts that multiple panes, last focused is the one that's going to get the new new note. And I think you can, I'm going to try control click. Oh, uh, it was like a right click, open a new tab. So that's another way that you can not lose track of what you were just looking at. Um, especially when you've got multiple panes and then you lose one and you're like, which one had the back button to the one I just was looking at because I was focusing on the content, not where it was or something, something like that. Yeah, so that's kind of a, an overview of the, the structure of left-hand side is your file organizations, uh, your search and anything that you star. And on the right-hand side is your content organized by panes and tabs. That's what we got. So we have a concept of links and uh, backlinks. So I'm just going to clear these out and, and set something up so you get a feel. Uh, Okay, so let's drag that in there. I think there's a way to do a setting. Uh, it really throws me that I don't think the defaults are right. That if you create a new file, uh, default location for new files, oh, it does say same as current file. Okay, so that went into the root instead of into the notes because, right, let's, let's play with a little bit of example, but I'm gonna use some collaborative input here because I can't think of any examples. So think of an atomic note and throw an idea and we'll we'll link it to another atomic note and we'll get a feel for how the links work and backlinks and all of that. So who's working on something or, or following something that's really interesting that they want showcased in an example? Don't all shout at once. I have used this tool so wrong. <laughs> so, like, I can show you an example of how to use this. I pretty much like I was using a couple of folders and notes and never linking anything with okay. anything. Well, we'll cover that. So it's just very wrong, like, yeah. So, so who's working on something that they're researching at the moment and just give you the title of the thing and we'll, we'll stick it in. Anything? Any ideas? Well, it's something that we're not working on. Okay. Rather, the effect of fake news on politics. Love it. Love it. So the effect of fake news on politics right that's we just needed a starting point so um we might want to this feels like quite a big thing so maybe this would actually be a, a map of content that we want to start specking out um, because i don't think we could answer that in one atomic note i think there's a lot of concepts there so maybe we'll spin off that and say news in social media could be a sub concept of that. So let's create a second note. Well, I'll create a section. So uh, it's like news in social media. Okay. And now I can uh, command click into that. And now I've created that note. And I might write about here um, news in social media. And the influence, oh, I can't type and demo at the same time, uh, by the likes and shares by the popular uh, people. I don't know. The more, more something is shared could influence the perception of whether something is consensus. So that would be there. Now I've got a link here. Um, let's spec this out a little bit more so we get a, get a feel for it. Uh, so fake news and on politics, any other kind of topics, gaps, anyone can throw out? Outrage and algorithms. Outrage and algorithms. Okay. So that's to say how algorithms 
Items that uh, yeah. generate outrage. So, uh, so we might pose that as a question. So, I could be thinking about this and thinking: uh, uh, Does the outrage or outrage create more influence on algorithms, resulting in it being shared more or seen more often? And then I might follow that with uh, some references where I want to be thinking about how social media algorithms work. And then that could be a new note. So I'm sort of following this path down. Um, and then this is getting more technical. You need to understand what, the, what those things are and you probably do some research to try and answer that because you're trying to, it's like the goal, the goal here is fake news has an influence on algorithms that can create a feedback loop that can either exacerbate or probably do exacerbate the outrage um, on that. So, okay, we've got, got some examples. I'm just, if I show you here, here's a little graph view. It's very, it's very cute, it's very small, um, but you start to think, okay, we've got these, these things building up. Um, which is quite nice. And uh, the purpose of doing this was to show you now that I can take any of these notes and I have this right hand pane where I can see the links and the back, well, the back links. So I can see outrage in the impact of algorithms is the link here. If I were to follow this one. Um, How do you open that? Uh, there's a little um, expand on the right hand side. So this is it's interesting. I can't, I'm not quite getting the mentions. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, so that's the title there. So I can see this is linked by outrage and the impact of algorithms. And there's a little snippet of the line where it's referenced from. So you can see the backlinks. Um, which is quite nice, especially if you've got something that's really popular and you want to remember where you've used it. Um, the backlinks are there. I might want to add some tags. So we'll go in here and we'll tag this one. So using the hash for hashtag, uh, social media, for example, and then on the right hand side, that appears there. If you don't see that tags, it is in a core plugin under tags. I think it's enabled by default now. And that's how that panel appears. I'd just like to point out that the tag is important to be able to see the tags so that you don't port your tags too much. Yes. So it's, you could say social media as a tag, but then you might change it. You can't don't remember exactly what tag you would exactly the formulation of that tag. Yes. And you don't want to create another tag that's like social media. Um, it would just make it more difficult to find those things like that. Yes. So, and there's a really cool thing about the tags pane that I quite like using is I haven't written this note, but I know it's kind of interesting, but I want to park it. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. So I might just tag it status slash to do. And now I've got this little collapsible. And then when I've done it, let's say I've done this one, I can go status slash done. And then I can see anything I've got to do. And and done. So if I'm making some fleeting notes and I've got, oh, that was an interesting thing. I might just put it as a to-do kind of <laughs> status so that it goes back my my top of my uh, my queue essentially. And then all that does is it does a search for all the notes um, for that. But there's a, a nice plugin, the data view plugin, which allows you to build your own like tooling to feel like you've got some real superpowers. So yeah, there's it's really lightweight in the sense of it's not forcing you down any way of structuring this. I could put those tags at the bottom if I want. Um, I can link in line. I can link at the end. It really doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, the, sorry, back to folder view up there. And if you're doing a Zettel casting, this folder might get with you know hundreds of notes in there, and that's okay. That's your Zettel casting. That's your your filing cabinet, 
Um, you might want to create, say, a folder for each um, set of literature notes. So then you can link within the context of that and then bring them over into your um, into your main Zettel Kassen as you kind of consider it in the wider context. And then you might want to create a folder just for, called archive, where you can put things that you no longer want to, like you've processed it, it's no longer relevant. Um, so there's no right or wrong way of doing it. Um, if you really want to archive it, maybe you could put that in a different vault, for example, if, if you just want to keep the clutter down, because it will impact things like when you're searching, um, you know, where it appears and things like that. In terms of yeah, editing links and stuff, you can just paste like a web link in and it'll automatically put make that linkable when you're in. I think if basically if I were to uh oh, I'll just use this as an example down here. If I just put like so notice that's a link. I'm in the edit mode, but I think if I control click that, it will um open the link. Or if I'm in preview mode, you get the little action that it's going to open up your browser so you can do that which is absolutely fine um let's have a look so yeah uh you can as i say put put your research in here you could put files in there if you you can put images in so when you preview those then so if you've got a diagram explaining a concept you can do all of that um I wonder if I've got a better so I'll switch this one to light mode. So here I'm using what's called the control palette, command palette, sorry. Uh if you've used it in VS code to find a file, I think it's on a Mac, it's command P, probably control P on the Windows. Uh, you can search a file and open it up really quickly that way. There is a command palette in VS Code with the shift key. I believe uh, this is just a command palette. I don't think you can find files um, with this. But uh, if there's a setting or something, you don't quite know where to find it. Just try searching for it in here. Um, so like if I want to go to light mode, light mode there. And sometimes just seeing what's possible can give you inspiration for, for something. So that's Bring that in. Uh, if you want to zoom in and out, because it's a web web app, um, command plus or minus uh, zooms in and out. So if it is too big, it's probably zoomed in. You don't realize it. Uh, okay. So here's an example of something that I've been playing with just to get some examples. Uh, and this is a, a graph view here. So you can zoom in and out. There's a few options. So you can filter it. So I can include all my tags if I want, which go in green. So if I want to see like what I've got as a status to do, or if it's neuroscience, I can now see visually what relates up there and see the clusters based on the tags. If I want to include my attachments, I can do that, which is quite nice. Um, and if I've created links, but I haven't created the file for it, um, I can turn those off. So you notice the little sort of ghosted links here. That shows me where I put a placeholder for future Martin to go and do some work, and I can see what what I put in there. But if I don't want to consider that right now, I can turn it off. Uh, and the orphaned links um, are where I've linked to something, but it hasn't expanded out anywhere else. So now I can see the fringes of where my understanding and my thinking has stopped. And beyond there is a whole new world for me to discover. Um, and the clusters are where I've done concentrated most of my thinking. Oh, sorry. What the, what the uh, style are you using? So, that again. So, oh. so, you, so your uh, nodes are colored. Oh, that's just the default um, that comes out of Obsidian. So I haven't. So they've. You can. I think you can change it. It doesn't come out that way from mine. So. Oh, okay. okay. It might be based on the theme. Yeah. Oh, the theme I, is what I mean. Yeah. So this this is just the default theme. Uh, where are the themes? Theme, theme, theme. Appearance. I'm just using. Yeah, base color theme and the default theme. Um, you can go wild and make it your own if um, if you wish. So there's lots of themes. And if you really want, you can create your own theme and edit the CSS and all of that, because it's very extensible. 
you can group things together by a query. So I could say everything that matches a tag or maybe a, a keyword in a line, I can group those somehow in terms of coloring. Um, so if you if you really want to visualize a particular thing, you've got that power to do that. You probably won't do that for a very long time as you're building up your kind of knowledge, knowledge graph. And uh, if you want to do a nice screenshot of something that you want to paste, you can tweak the, the styling, node size, line thickness and cool thing is you can animate it based on the font. I think the timestamp of uh when you created these things which I think is beautiful um there's a there's a command line that you can run on your git repository which uh, animates you working on a big project which is quite fun and this is similar so um yeah you know have some fun um little question is super cute and I, but <laughs> do you find yourself using this mode um personally i probably haven't got that far in my journey to make it useful mm -hmm. um but is so full disclosure i'm trying to build my own note-taking app so um, i'm using this as research uh, and graph view is something that is a very sought after feature so i'm guessing it is useful and I'm yeah, for seeing the clusters and sort of looking at your Zettelkast and and you know that process where you're not researching, you're just going through and seeing where where your thinking can happen. That's a nice place to start. Pick a thing, see what it links to, and start thinking more laterally of what it means and and all of that. So yeah, so this is this is the graph view. It it looks nice. It. Um, probably gives you a bit of a dopamine hit to know that you've created lots of stuff that could be useful, but it makes you feel good. Um, and then as you get used to it, you know, you'll find find the particular uses uh, of you know, diving into particular topics and stuff. Uh, what I've read is that uh, if you look at, for example, the thick nodes in your graph, the ones that have a lot of links into them, those are maybe decent targets for doing an MOC. Uh, yes. Where you're then going to kind of construct a narrative Correct. around all those links being related. Correct. Uh, and you might know it's being related. You might even find that your, your map of contents get pulled into it, and they could be your map of contents in a way. So as an entry point to figure out where to get into something, that could be a nice, the bigger the node. Um, and of course, you've got the local graph as well, uh, which I have to remember how to do. There was a way to do it. Sorry, I can't. I can't remember. But you can take a note and then get the, a mini graph view of that. Um, but again, uh, open. It's in the file. No, sorry, I won't waste time on that because I can't. Um, so yeah, some of you might like to organize things more visually lay things out and obsidian has launched a thing called canvas so if you click on the hamburger uh this one yeah, and you go down to open link to view oh i did have it i i remember when i was looking it up it was the most ridiculous place to find that link but okay. yes there's the local graph of this note and then i can sort of explore out and go back so you don't have to see the whole thing you can just follow the links that way thank you okay so there's a thing called canvas so let's look at what i've got here so i might have like a map of content kind of canvas um where you can embed an actual web page into this view you can maybe use that as a bit of bit of research, bit of reference, use it as a mood board or anything like that. And I can pull in notes on the left hand side and drop it in as a card, which gives me a preview of that content. Or I can essentially just drag almost like a sticky note kind of type of type of note in here, um, which only exists in the canvas that, that doesn't exist as a file. And then I can drag relationships between them. Now, this is what we call a core plugin for Obsidian. So Obsidian themselves have built this. Um, there are some caveats. These relationships here aren't the same as links between nodes. So they won't appear on the graph view. 
They only exist within, the, within this visualization here. That may change in the future if they figure out how to infer those links and build up a bigger map here. Plug in is Canvas. Canvas. Yeah. yeah. So this you will need the latest version for this. It is a core plugin uh, called Canvas here. And the way to create a Canvas is you create a new file, but instead of a markdown note, you're creating a .canvas file. It is a JSON uh, encoded file, so it is your data. However, good luck interpreting it in any other way other than Obsidian, because it's obviously their own spec of what it is. So yeah, I can go like new canvas and I can, uh, let's say, got some, got a slip box here. So I can just drag some notes in. I can uh, resize this. So if I want to make it smaller and if I double click into it, I can actually edit that. So now I can build up a nice large view of uh, these notes. So, so I could look at that, I can group them together. Um, so if you'd like to think visually, you like to lay things out, this is a good way to create like that, some kind of map of content visually. Um, if you want to use it as kind of a bit of your note taking, then by all means, and you could put images in there, media in there as well. And uh, uh, if you really want, you can even play Quake in it if you, uh, uh, it's because it's a live web page in there. So um, uh, go to town if your computer can handle it. Um, I won't play that because it will. It doesn't run very very fast, but you can do it. So yeah, that's kind of the canvas in a in a nutshell. There's a few kind of neat features like zoom to fit. Um, there's a few other kind of hotkeys which are quite nice. Uh, if I've got them here. Oh, loads of notes on it. Um, so I believe I can shift select multiple things. I think it's control, Apple. No, I don't know what I'm doing. I've only lost it. Um, there is a hotkey, shift, oh, shift and two. So I could say, actually, I just want to look at those three things. Shift and two zooms in. Shift and one zooms back out. So uh, if you're on a trackpad, you can go up, down, left, right. If you've only got a mouse, I think I think you hold one of the one of the key modifier keys to um scroll left and right. Uh, and a neat neat trick if you've ever used any design software like um I think now any of the Adobe design software or uh, you hold the Alt Option key and you can drag and duplicate things. That's so if you've got something that you just want to create so many of them, then that's a neat way of doing it. Uh, alt or the option key, you on a Mac or Windows? Uh, Windows. I think it's Alt and drag. Um, quite a lot of this. Ah, metadata front matter so you can get quite fancy with this if you really want where you can create a thing called front matter so this is who's familiar with yaml so um what does it stand for uh it's yet another language. so what was it yet another markup language almost it says for yaml ain't a markup language or yaml ain't markup language so we're being we're trying to catch people out i guess um <laughs> So YAML is sort of text-friendly, human-friendly way of articulating kind of key value pairs. You do arrays of properties. Um, trying to think of which one of these has that example in. Uh, let's look for, oh, I think I did it under. So let's have read the book, The Chimp Paradox. Um, this here is the front matter, so it has to come at the beginning of the file, and it's denoted by three dashes. And that tells Obsidian, if you start with three dashes, pay attention, got some front matter coming on, which is some configuration. And I can put whatever I want in here. Um, so I can say, I'm going to invent a key called type. I want to call this a book. Uh, I could put a release date in here. Um, tags and alias slash aliases 
are reserved keywords, so they do mean something. So those will, I believe, go as tags on the tag pan, panel pane. Um, and the alias means that I could search for, say, monkey brain and get an inference that I actually mean the chimp paradox book. So you can use it in that sense there. Um, when you preview, um, I've got a plugin called Meta Table, but normally this would hide away and be invisible. A Meta Table is a plugin that allows me to now see that as um, something that looks prettier in dark mode than light mode, apparently. Um, but you can now see like a, a table version of that front matter that you can collapse away. So here's an example where I would create you know, a reference for a book I've been reading. I can drop in the cover so I know what it looks like and all of that. Um, I think there's some publishing, if you use the Obsidian Publish, I think some front matter goes into there, maybe for the status, whether it's draft or published. I haven't looked into too much of that, but um, but yeah, you can use this to do some metadata around your notes. You might want to put in the front matter your workflow rather than a hashtag sitting around somewhere. Um, and uh, what's really cool about this is now you can use other plugins like the data view plugin to treat your notes like a database. So this, if you imagine this is a record in a database now for all my books, I've got it classified as a, as a book type. I know the release date, it's got some tags and I can do some really funky things. So this um, data view plugin. So if I look at the community plugins, uh, I'm, I'm only running three just for demo purposes. Um, data view, which treats it like a database and presents it in tables or lists. Kanban, and we know what Kanban is. And we, if you don't know what Kanban is, it's the way of organizing things as like cards in lanes and you can drag them across lanes. So I might have a to-do column with some cards in it, drag it to doing, drag it to done, or I might want to organize it by whatever I want. Uh, I'll cover that uh, in a moment. And then the meta table shows us. Um, if, you, if you want to run community plugins, um, you do get a security warning so restricted mode is on by default because it is running third-party code on your machine. So tread carefully in case someone releases a dodgy plugin that tries to do naughty things. Uh, but it's generally quite good to look at the usage of a plugin. Half a million, over half a million people are using some of these plugins. So it's kind of pretty good. Um, regarding the from uh, um... Is there any way to work with titles in the front matter? Like personally, for example, like my um my note names are just the ID, like a, a day being like um kind of like year, month, day, yeah. hour. So sort of like a journal of what you were doing at the given time. Yeah, stuff. just just so that every note has a an a, a unique identifier and that's also the name of the file itself. Yeah. Um, but like um Obsidian recognizes that as the title. And I normally actually have the title as the, as in the front matter as one of the of the tags. Do you know how how to tell Obsidian what to read in the in the front matter? Is that like I called it? Is... Good question. I do not know the answer if Obsidian itself can use so I guess it can use the alias property. Uh, as something, uh, but I'm not sure about the title, the explicit title. It's a good question. Okay. I don't know the answer. But, um, yeah. So yeah, there's there are 822 community plugins. So it's very versatile. Some will do really minor things. Some will do quite powerful things, like the data data view. So I mean, let's explore this more. Um, well, actually, before I do this, I'm just going to cover. If like, you click on any of the plugins, it actually opens a page. Uh, yeah. Markdown that shows you what it does. Yeah, the, um, and then it links to the GitHub repo, so you can you can look at the source code yourself. Um, but the, they'll have a README. The data view plugin, I think, it even has its own website that teaches you how to use it because it's got its own query language, which is hardcore, um, uh, especially when you're trying to demo it very quickly. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'll just show that. If you look at a plugin, so like here's the data view, clicked on that. Um, it gives you a preview. 
So if the author of the plugin is very kind and actually explains what the plugin does and how to use it and all of that, it's really good. And you can you can look through there. And I think many YouTubers go through like what the, the hip plugins are these days and how to use them and that. Um, so yeah, before I go into the data plugin, I'm just gonna talk about source code. So let's oh, code docs. So I can create code blocks, and this is really, really handy using the triple tick. Oh, go away. So the triple tick is a signal to Obsidian that you're about to put some code in, and you close it with another triple tick. And if you're wondering what the triple tick key is, um, it's in the top left next to the one key. Uh, which isn't listed on a map. Oh, no, wait. Oh, yeah, ironically, I'm looking at the Windows keyboard here, top, next to the one key or next to the Z key on a Mac. So um, what do we call it? Call it a back tick, I think is the official name. So triple back tick. And then you can actually say the language of that code that you're working in, so TypeScript. And there's a, there's a third party kind of JavaScript library, which Obsidian uses that has all the popular languages. I think it's like, a few hundred different languages that you can just switch into published view. So if yeah, can... so in published view, uh, it shows the code and you get a nice little copy link. So you can now paste it into VS Code and run that. So so nice way of documenting stuff that is easily reusable. And if you use a single backtick, then you can inline the code formatting, which I like using when I'm talking about maybe variable names or class names or whatever from code where I'm doing it in a sentence. Um, and it, yeah, it makes it nice, like putting the div tag there as a as a little code inline code block. So this is really, really quite nice, um, especially when you're working with tech. This is why Obsidian is really great if you're working with tech to document your understanding. Uh, if you were creating like a code style guideline or you wanted to create, if you're creating, like let's say you're learning a new program language, like learning React, for example. <laughs> you might use the Zettelkasten to create those atomic notes of those key concepts, how to create a function component, how to uh, use the use state hook kind of thing. And you could just break it down that way and then kind of rebuild it in a map of content to outline your, your structure of that. Um, and if you have a piece of code or a command that you use quite often, just create a note for it. So you can copy it out and you don't have to type it every time. Um, so yeah. Use. So with that in mind, we can now use the thing called the data view, uh, which is in which folder? Oh, I oh, I've lost it. Uh, oh, data view. So this is another plugin that utilizes the back ticks, but you prefix it with data view. And now I can put a query, like a, if anybody's worked with SQL, it's a bit like SQL, where I can say generate a table where the column, the property author, so remember I put that author key in the front matter. So if I show you side by side what I mean, uh, let's give it a note, not that, sorry. Uh, that's going to put the link in. I'm obviously doing something really silly here. Uh, new tab. Right. Okay. We'll put it side by side. There we go. So here, um, I want to pull the author. Now, I've done something a little sneaky here, is the author comes from... this inline property, because I wanted to write written by Professor Steve Peters, but I annotated it. This is all part of the data view plugin uh, with the author colon colon, and then I put the property. And now that is like a, a piece of metadata that's inline plus the metadata in the front matter. I can say what the year was as well. So I can build a table. Here's an author, the year I can, get the number of uh, or all the mentions of this book 
So there's a bit of a bit of notation to say from this file, what's linking in, to put that under a mentions column. And then I can count using length the number of mentions. So when I render that, I can see that I've got two books, The Chimp Paradox and The Brain That Changed Itself. I've pulled in the author, I've pulled in the years, and I've got a bullet point list of everything that's linking to it and the number of links. You know, I might not want it exactly like that, but it gives you an idea of what you can and can't do. So if you wanted to create a map of content of various things, what are all my notes that are to do? What are all my questions? So I could use a tag to say question, for example, uh, or, or property. Uh, what are all the things I'm currently reading? You can build up as many files as you want that just generates the view that you want. And that's what we mean by treating your note system like a database. And then you can just click into one of those and takes you to where, where you want to work on it. So it's really powerful. Um, if you want to get really snazzy, you can do data view JS and you can actually write JavaScript and um, generate this. What is this? Gets a list of books, where the type is book, and then it outputs, it maps it into uh, a list there. Um, so, you know, as if we don't all have enough to do already, you can go start programming your note taking system, which is. Really I think you can provide interesting tables. Uh, without any front matter at all. That's to say that uh, you can create lists of all of your notes in a particular folder, uh, sorted by the number of words. Yes. In that, uh, or, or sorted by uh, the date. Uh, and that metadata is already in there. So that can be quite useful if you're looking for your less developed notes, which have fewer words, or which have more words. Uh, yeah. That, that those can be clues to look at value. Yeah. And with zero casting. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we can, it's the difference between using uh, explicit data. So I put it in the front matter, I put a property or inferred data. What have I not got any text on? What have I put in that I haven't built out? And, um, I haven't really played with this in any more depth than this because it's like a whole other thing to learn, but it's really powerful. So, a lot of you have to put here is just not getting Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I wanted to get something that gives us a taste of what's possible. So, uh, and the other thing is, um, Kanban, if you like. Have you ever used, anyone used Notion at all? Yeah, so that's got the Kanban view. Um, you can create these items in here. These exist within the camp, within the note here. Um, unlike the canvas, it's still marked down, but um, I think it's like embedded something in the markdown. So, um, so it's, I believe, still a note. Oh no, I think this is actually just a Kanban. Uh, you can't add notes to this, but you can drag notes in, which is essentially um, the link to the note. I thought that might be fully, full markdown, but it isn't. It is just a link that's supported, or you can just create random, you know, just type into it. Um, and the whole point of a Kanban is that you can drag things across. So if you really want to kind of invest in Obsidian, you can do your workflow. This is my task list for the next week. Put them in, drag them across, and uh, work like that. So yeah, there's the other thing that I will mention that is quite useful is um, oh, there's just a couple of things. You can create task lists, and there's a notation that if you do like a list with a minus, and then use this format here, square bracket x means it's checked off, and no x means it's not. When you're in preview mode, it makes it like this. So it's quite nice. Um, and if you edit, that will actually edit the markdown file um, as you tick things on. So if you like lists, you can create lists. Yeah, I think that's pretty much the whistle stop tour of Obsidian. Uh, let's try it. So uh, if I was to think about that, I would probably just tab that in. And then, uh, and it's, it's smart enough to know that if you tick off the parent thing, all the sub things have to be done. So, uh, yeah, good suggestion. There is actually one other thing. So we we touched on earlier having sort of like core principles or something that you don't want to repeat yourself in a note. Um, 
you can. Uh, I don't think I've got an example here. Uh, ah, you can actually um, put an exclamation mark in front of your internal link, and that will preview it. And if you put a hash, so like if I put a hash here, I can actually link to a particular block within that note. So I can go to the seal source or whatever. And when I go and preview that, that whole note gets pulled in. So if you want to create some kind of maybe revision or overview where you want to collapse and expand out the sections, um, so you get that kind of organization of lots of concepts pulled into one note, you can do that. So this is why I'm not so concerned about making things atomic because you always create a note that builds up the bigger view of it, but you've still got the individual notes atomically. And that's quite, quite nice. Uh, anyone need to use math jacks at all? So uh, this is actually out of the box. You don't need a plugin for this. And I thought, ha, that's nice and simple. What about um, referencing them? Because one one problem that I, I found in versus like working with, like for example, in, in LaTeX uh, directly is like referencing the text to a certain equation. Oh. I, I don't need it to be across notes, but like if you're like, let's say writing and you're, I don't know, like going through like a theorem um, um, proof. Or something like that, and you're like, oh, and then we use equation three and equation five, and uh, to get this result. Like that's something that I haven't been able to do with the one I use currently, but okay. the one I use currently use latex. So, so I'm going to try something, and you tell me if this makes sense. If you want to use um, the math jacks notation, double dollar, it's out the box. Put it in, close it, the double dollar, and then uh, it will render it like that. Now. In, in line, in line, we Oh, is it? Okay, brilliant. Yeah, good question. Okay. In line as well as just oh, yeah. What happens if I do that? It's just standard line depth. Ah, that's left justified now. Brilliant. So, excellent, excellent. I don't use this in any of the work that I do, so this is like a whole new sense of discovery. But let's say uh, I got one. Let's title it. Second line to title, and then let's say there's a. Assume it's different because I don't. I don't know how to make it different, but uh, two. So let's say you've got all these explanations going down, and they're rendered like that. Let's try an example. So conclusion, and I want to reference. Let's say two. What I do know is I can use an. I believe I can use an up carrot symbol. The carrot symbol. Um, let's say ref two. Now, can I link to MathJack example with a hash uh, to that work? A oh, ref to. So, what it's actually done is it's inserted its own reference number there, which is probably the better better option. So, I can get rid of this. But the, I could edit that and make it the same. I think it would work. And now, yes, I can link to it and I can hover over it and I can see exactly what I'm what I referenced there. So not sure if that answers your question, but you can annotate bits of a note. I could have I could have actually referenced that in a separate note and it would probably made more sense. And if I really want to be um, super explicit, put an exclamation mark in front and it will actually render that block. Okay, I suppose. Well, I was referring to something a bit more simple. Like normally, when you're writing in LaTeX, yeah, you can use like yeah, one one block and say like begin equation and end equation. We'll okay, yeah. the same text there, and then you can you can do like something you you feel like a slash um, or yeah, like back backslash label and a name, and you say like eq one, and then you can say somewhere else in the test you can you can do like ref eq one. And it will like automatically that will have put a number like to the right of the equation based on where it appears in the text. And then the ref will refer. And that means that you don't have to keep renumbering them if you, for example, okay. like add um, one on top. And I haven't found a way to do that with KTEX. So I'm just wondering if my math um, jacks was, was able to do that. Good question. I do not know the answer. That is like, <laughs> yeah, I'm learning as I go from what you're saying. <laughs> uh, could very well be. I just don't know enough about about that. Um, so yeah, 
that's probably the bulk of obsidian um happy to take questions at this point and i appreciate i kind of given a little sample of what a zettel cast and an obsidian would look like um yes um, data is it only possible to use it when you uh, put that meta data heading or can you use it no you can use it for, so the built-in metadata about the files things like the file name the number of links coming into it what links to it uh, there's probably a whole host of other things maybe the date the last last modified date so probably got access to all of that so you can just list things out you can probably interrogate the hashtags for example if that's naturally in your in your files there you can do like search with specific text so it can be really powerful number of words number of words yeah um it's only when there's missing you, where you can't infer the data you need to explicitly put it in somehow um yeah, i guess you can start the ml format you know just by using double columns uh, with any keyword that will automatically convert it into a key that you could query or they just read it like you uh yeah that was a two colon example yeah. so you can do inline tagging as well which i sort of had an example of with the um partly because i didn't want to repeat the author's name in the metadata and then in the body of the text just as an example so so i can do inline metadata without the front matter with that notation there so single square bracket key colon colon and then whatever the value is so you can yeah you can architect your own universe really if you really want um yeah Final opportunity for questions. Who's going to use Zettelkasten now? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, if you have any questions, you've got my contact details on those slides. I'm more than happy to field any questions, help guide. It helps my learning. The questions you asked helps me know how to teach um 